In this first video, we're really going to start discussing what an action potential is, and in particular, start introducing all the key aspects of a neuron that we're going to need to go forward to actually derive a mathematical model to, de uh, to describe action potentials. So again, our main objective here is to introduce key components of a neuron, how they fire. Basically, we're going to skim the surface of all the biochemistry involved in these aspects. And on that note, we're going to try and basically abstract the key ideas away. And in doing so, we're going to ask ourselves, what should we actually go ahead and try to mathematically model? As we'll see, there's going to be a lot of moving parts to these types of neurons, as you might expect. So maybe modeling everything will be way too complicated, but maybe we can sort of combine some ideas and just trying to model some key aspects. So on that note, let's jump forward and start talking about action potentials. So what actually is an action potential? So for those of you who may not heard this term before, basically an action potential for us at least from a mathematical view, this is an electrical impulse. And these electrical impulses send signals all over your body. And really what these action potentials are all about is really what happens when a neuron basically goes from negative to positively charged. And when we talk about charge, we are literally talking about charge like you may have remembered from things involving electricity, where there's positive and negative charges. For us, those would be basically different types of ions, which have a positive or negative charge. But we'll get all to that in a moment. For us, actually, you might be wondering what this plot is on the right-hand side of the screen. And this is actually our action potential dynamics. So long story short, and as a spoiler, our neurons basically want to be in a state of resting. Now, this is in terms of what we call voltage or potential here. And voltage is really just trying to measure the signal across the cell membrane. So I'll just write that down here as a key aspect. Oops. And for us, what voltage is, is really going to be telling us that story of all these positive and negative charges in the neuron or outside the neuron and how the charge in the neuron compares to the charge outside the neuron for that matter. And this difference in basically that charge or what we're calling voltage here and that difference of measurements across the cell membrane is what we're actually talking about when we're looking at action potential dynamics. So in this plot, what you can imagine at this sort of resting potential, this is our neuron just sort of relaxing, hanging out. This is where it wants to be. It actually spends a lot of energy to just try and stay in that resting potential state. However, this is a plot of voltage versus time. And what can happen in terms of when we actually see an action potential, like the following plot has, we see a basically a rapid spike in the voltage. And we'll get into all the reasons that this happens in a few moments, but this action potential really is talking about a spike in the voltage versus time. And then slowly the voltage starts to decrease and head back towards that resting potential. But of course it'll overshoot that resting potential just slightly and then slowly basically start to head over back to where it wants to be in terms of its original resting potential. So this is the story of action potentials in a nutshell. We see these spikes in these voltage patterns over time, and then eventually that spike in voltage will start decreasing and then dissipate and head back towards where that neuron wants to be in terms of its overall resting potential. So this is a cute story, 
So far I've introduced this idea of voltage and it's really the spike in voltage that is what's sending signals all over your body, neuron to neuron and things like that. We're actually just gonna talk about one neuron here as we go forward. So actually let's go ahead and just introduce our neuron. So let's bring up a key character for our neuron story here. And now our neuron, this is of course a very idealized mathematical view into neurobiology. But what I want us to recognize here and what's important for us going forward as mathematical biologists just at this stage is we're thinking about a couple key components of these neurons. Now, like I said earlier, at rest, the neuron wants to have a negative charge. It's spending a lot of energy to be in that resting potential or resting voltage state. However, there is stuff happening in this neuron all the time. For example, we have a bunch of potassium ions, the K plus ions here, and these have positive charge. We also have a lot of sodium ions inside this cell as well, and these also have positive charge. Now, I want to just mention that even though we have these sort of two characters we're talking about, these positive ions, the sodium and potassium ions have positive charge. Even though we're talking about these two characters, there's actually many, many more negatively charged things inside this cell to actually keep its overall resting charge negative or its resting voltage negative. So these are what we call anions. They're negatively charged ions. We don't actually have to describe who they are as we go forward with this story. For us right now, we just think there's a couple different positively charged ions sort of hanging out inside the cell. Outside the cell, we also see other positively charged ions. In fact, those same types of ions, potassium and sodium for that matter, except there's differences in concentration of these ions. So for example, in our neuron, there's a high concentration of potassium. And there's a low concentration of our sodium ions. Outside neuron, we have the opposite scenario. We have a low concentration of potassium and we have a high concentration of our sodium. Now, why is this important? Well, I'm gonna just grab this, bring this to the next page. That's right, even in videos, I'm talking to myself. But why is this important? And this comes back to this idea of when we talk about things like diffusion or things wanting to move from higher concentrations to lower concentrations. So I'll just make that general note. Even ions want to move from high concentrations to low concentrations. So this is really kind of our motivational aspect where we're actually going to start seeing the flow of ions moving in and out of this neuron. Now, a question you might be wondering now is, how does that actually happen? Are these things just kind of popping out of the cell, like popping out of a bubble or anything? And the answer actually lies in something that we need to discuss of what happens near the cell membrane of these actual neurons. And this happens with cells all the time. Every cell in our body generally has these types of components. So for example, there are these, what we think of as slides or these tunnels in and out of the cell that we call ion channels. 
And for us, what I want to recognize is these ion channels are our way in and out of the cell for some of these ions. And there's a lot of different types of ion channels. Now, we are really just skimming the surface of all this really interesting kind of cellular biology and biochemistry. So again, this isn't the full story, but this is sort of the story that we need to progress forward for our mathematical models. So let's bring up our view of our cell again, or our neuron here, except this time we're gonna introduce those tunnels. So in this case, these kind of little tunnels poking in and out of the cell are ion channels that I'm talking about. And what's interesting is there are different, many different kinds of ion channels, like I mentioned a couple of moments ago. In particular for us, I want us to think about a couple things. And this comes back to our ideas of where are concentrations high or low. So for example, if we're thinking inside the neuron, we have a high concentration of sodium. So this high concentration of sodium inside the neuron. Well, through these ion channels, basically these potassium ions are gonna to wanna to flow out where they will flow towards a lower concentration of, of the potassium. So these potassium ions are trying to flow out of this neuron. Whereas, on the other hand, we have a low amount of sodium inside of the, of the neuron. And on the outside, we have a high concentration of sodium. So the sodium from the outside is going to want to flow into that neuron. And we can start thinking about this process as a very dynamic thing that's happening. And actually, it's through these flow of ions that we actually start seeing the spike in the action potential, since these are charges basically moving in and out of the cell. So there's a couple key aspects for us to discuss. So let's actually start listing those steps. So this again is just a crude view of what happens inside our neuron. or I should say inside of this system. And the first thing is our cell is in its resting state. So this is where it has the negative potential, its resting potential, where we actually see at the beginning that there's more uh, potassium ion con or a higher potassium ion concentration in the neuron than the sodium concentration. Now, what's gonna happen is basically that it's these lipids or fats in the cell membrane that allow things to basically enter or leave the cell. We have these ion channels as well, which are proteins along the membrane. And these ions are gonna to wanna to kind of go in and go out of the cell. And this is where the dynamic process really happens, where we start seeing the flow of ions doing different things. And of course, for us, what's gonna be important is we're thinking of this through the use of ion channels. So when we actually start thinking about these ion channels, the process that happens is we can think of this as an ion basically attaching itself to a channel. And this channel is actually a really interesting dynamical, um, has a dynamical morphology. It's basically going to kind of bend and change shape to just allow this ion to move through it. 
And this, of course, is assuming that these are specific ion channels then for a specific ion. So for example, there are going to be certain types of potassium ions we're talking about, as well as certain types of sodium channels as well. The fourth thing that'll happen is when we start seeing the flow of ions, we're actually going to see different time scales in these different types of flows of ions. Basically, what I mean by that is the sodium channels, when sodium ions are coming from the higher concentration of sodium outside that neuron into the lower concentration of sodium in that neuron, this is a fast acting process. These sodium ions are flowing very quickly into that neuron. And because of this, the voltage becomes more positive. Or the voltage increases, we should say. And this is where we can start seeing these spikes in these potentials. And this is what we call the basically a positive feedback aspect. As in the more of these positive sodium ions that flow into the cell, the more of these voltage gated sodium channels will open up and allow more and more sodium ions to flow in. So for example, when we talk about ion channels, there's a lot of different types of ion channels. And in this case, what we're thinking about are what we call these voltage mitigated or voltage gated channels. And what this means is these channels are going to open or close depending on what that voltage at the cell membrane actually is or across that cell membrane is. So if there's more and more positive charges flowing into that cell, the voltage is getting the voltage is increasing more and more more and more of these ion channels are going to open and allow more ions to flow in so we see this positive feedback the more things that flow in the more of these ion channels that open so the more things will flow in now as you might imagine like we said a couple moments ago well our cell doesn't want to have this positive or this high rate a high amount of voltage across its cell membrane it wants to be in that lower resting state. So if we go back to our original plot, our neuron really wants to be down here in this resting potential. What we're discussing right now is through that flow of sodium ions that this potential is spiking up. So the cell or the neuron is basically going to try and combat this in one way or another. So we're going to start to just start to discuss what's happening to basically starting to drive this voltage back downward. And before we do that, I just want to quickly mention in terms of our neurobiology story here that we also see that the um, potassium ions are also flowing out of this neuron. So this, even though the sodium ions are positively charged flowing in, we do see some positively charged ions flowing out in terms of this potassium. But this potassium happens much more slowly because these voltage-gated potassium channels basically will be a much more slow acting process than the sodium channels. So once those sodium ions start flowing, the potassium basically aren't, be, aren't going to be able to leave that cell quick enough to basically keep that voltage at equilibrium or keep that voltage at its resting potential state. So what's going to happen from the neurons perspective? So there's two things that generally happen in terms of these types of cells. The first thing, we see a blocking mechanism start to occur where it's literally going to stop, start trying to halt the flow of these sodium ions into those channels. 
Oops. So this is basically this mechanism down here. Once the voltage gets high enough across that cell membrane, this thing is literally trying to block the sodium from entering those channels so the sodium can't get pumped from the outside of that cell into that neuron. So this is going to try and protect that cell from getting higher and higher voltages. But this process occurs slowly. So again, the reason I mentioned these time scales is this sodium is flowing into the cell a lot faster than these other mechanisms are taking place to basically reduce the voltage once again. So the other thing that generally happens is like we said before, those potassium voltage gated channels start opening. And again, this happens slowly. So the K plus ions can flow out of cell. or our neuron in this case. But again, this happens a lot slower compared to the rate in which those sodium ions are flowing into that cell. So these are the two basic mechanisms that I'm going to discuss at least for how our neuron can start reducing its voltage once again. So once we see that very fast increase in the voltage potential, the cell is doing these two mechanisms to basically try and drive its voltage back downward. So I just want us to note that. Both of these mechanisms are slow in comparison to the rate at the rate in which the I or the sodium ions are quickly moving into the neuron. The second thing I want us to recognize is just to say, you know what? When the voltage is less than its resting voltage, these mechanisms turn off. So all this to say basically, when these mechanisms then turn off, we can start to see that cell goes back to its resting state, but then this whole entire process could happen once again. So I realize that this is just a very crude overview of a lot of the beautiful dynamics that are happening in cells or in neurons for that matter. So let's quickly just walk through that entire story again. So for us, what's happening is this neuron is at a negative resting voltage state, and it wants to maintain that state. However, sodium ions start flowing into this neuron. Because those sodium ions are flowing into that neuron, the voltage starts to increase. Now, because the voltage is increasing then, basically the cell is going to try and invoke two different mechanisms it has to try and reduce that voltage once again. And those mechanisms are very slow acting in comparison to the rate in which the sodium ions are flowing in. So the more positive ions are flowing in of the sodium, the more these voltage gated sodium channels are opening, more and more sodium are getting, are getting pumped in through those channels. 
but then the cell's trying to stop that flow by either using its blocking mechanisms to just cut off those ion channels from allowing more sodium into that neuron, or they're also opening these voltage-gated potassium channels so the potassium can flow back out. And since now we have positive ions flowing out, it's gonna drive that voltage back downward in that neuron. So this is a very crude story again of what's happening with neurons to basically create these action potentials. There's a much, much more beautiful biology that we can talk about in terms of the specifics. But for us as a mathematical viewpoint, this is enough for us to go forward. And there's a lot of characters we can think about in terms of how we wanna start modeling this type of scenario mathematically. I mean, for one thing, we see we have all these different ions we could start thinking about. We have the other anions that are sort of driving that neuron to have a negative charge at rest. We have all these different types of ion channels. We have this blocking mechanism. We have the voltage that's dependent on the concentrations of those positive ions inside the neuron. So there's a lot of things we could think about. And what I want us to actually take away from this is, well, what we're actually after is trying to recover these types of action potential signals that we originally talked about right at the start today. We really want to try and create a math model in which we can try to get these types of dynamics of these action potentials. So for us, what to model? And like we said before, there's lots of, lots of dynamical aspects to these neurons to create these types of voltage action potential signatures. So for us, what we're actually going to try and model that seems to be important is, well, the first thing, the voltage potential itself. And this voltage potential, like we talked about, will depend on all those ions, the ion concentrations, where those higher or lower concentrations are and all of that stuff. But for us as mathematicians, or mathematical biologists at this stage, we can think about what if we just tried to model that voltage? Is that going to be enough? Do we actually have to start thinking about these individual ion concentrations just at this stage? And the second thing we could try to model is, well, if that voltage is increasing, there needs to be some mechanism to basically bring it back down to where that neuron wants to be in terms of its resting potential. So the other thing we could think about modeling is just this, we can just call this as a blocking mechanism. So on one hand, we are really throwing a lot of stuff under the rug here in terms of the neurobiology happening. And we're just going to ask ourselves, if we just consider the voltage and we consider this blocking mechanism, are those going to be enough aspects to start thinking about capturing these action potential dynamics? And now I just want to mention the way that we're doing it here is kind of a first gateway, at least I see, into mathematically modeling action potentials and sort of some neuron dynamics. But this world of math modeling and neurobiology or neuromechanics gets really, really sophisticated very quickly. So again, we are after what we call the Fitsunagumo equations here. Which are actually a reduced model, and they're a popular, popular reduced model of what are called the Hodgkin-Huxley equations, which some of you may have heard about in maybe some um, more neurobio courses you may have taken. So with that, check out the next video in which we actually start trying to describe some of the mathematics here.